Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Chad Anderson, the host of the Gray Malkin Lane podcast, where queer friends and allies gather to review and discuss the original X-Men comics uh, with a creative professional joining us every episode. Uh, feel free to follow us on Gray Malkin P, P like podcast on Twitter, Gray Malkin underscore Lane on Instagram. You can listen to us wherever you find your podcasts. You are watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this amazing day with a very talented and creative person. He is the host of a very incredible podcast, not only talking about X-Men, but you know, this is great because I haven't talked about X-Men in forever. And, and I happen to be co-hosting on his show on March 30th. This will be released well after I'm on the show. We are joined, though, by the ever-talented Chad Anderson, host of the Gray Malkin Lane Podcast, which is an X-Men podcast. How are you doing today? I am so good, Kurt. It's so <laughs> nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you face-to-face, -face, finally, instead of over the phone. <laughs> yeah, we've been chatting and talking for a little while. It's great to see you in person, and I'm excited to have you on my show soon, too. Yeah, the, you gave me something that I haven't read before, and, and I'm not going to spoil anything. That means they have to listen to your show, obviously, for that. Uh, and it was a, an interesting read, because I had never really touched on that age of the X-Men comics. But for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, as we're getting ahead of ourselves, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Uh, my name is Chad Anderson. I am 44 years old. I work as a therapist in my day job, which is about half of my time. I also have two small children that are, well, not small anymore. They're 14 and 11. I live in Salt Lake City with my husband and just kind of a nice structured life here. But I have always uh, been a creative person. Outside of my main job, I usually am always doing something creatively. Uh, at times that has meant producing shows, I've made a documentary, I've written a couple of books and graphic novels, I worked for Marvel Comics for several years as a writer, and in the last three years I started podcasting. Coming out of COVID, I needed a project, and I came up with this concept of exploring the X-Men from the beginning. Most people only look at the comics kind of after the Claremont run or after the animated series, but I wanted to go back to the very early stuff in the Silver Age and talk about all of the stuff that is built from then, and we're doing that from a nerdy kind of queer lens. It's been a really fun ride the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I listened to a couple of your episodes and I listened to your episode 66 most recently. And I, that was a, a blast just to kind of understand and, and hear everyone just geeking out over X-Men because I grew up with the animated series, so I was never well read in it. So you introducing me to what we're reading was, was amazing. So I can't wait to dive more into that. It's a lot of fun. It's been really fun to, uh, every episode we try to feature a, an interview with a professional and then we review the old comics together. So yeah, that X-Men 66 when you talked about, it's me, Anthony Oliveira, Josh Trujillo, and George Jordan White just hanging out and laughing and being nerds and having fun as friends. It's a really fun time as we talk about both serious things and nonsensical things, which is kind of the idea. Okay, now I have to ask this question before I jump into some of my more pressing questions is this, who is the best and worst leader in the X-Men universe? And who is the best and worst villain of the X-Men universe? And here's the stipulation, it can't be Professor X or Magneto. <laughs> I think those answers are tricky. The uh, the interesting thing with the X-Men that I'm realizing more and more over time is it's a giant franchise. You got to think of it like a huge toy box full of toys. I mean, there's tens of thousands of stories, creators that are influenced by their times, hundreds and hundreds of people who have worked on these characters. So my answer, if you listen to my show, I always tell my kids when they ask me big questions, my answer is always depends on the storyteller. <laughs> so it depends on the era of comics. It depends on the story being told. My favorite character is going to shift from 
from time to time. I'm going to answer today. I will answer your questions. I reserve the right to change my answer <laughs> at any moment, at any point in the future. The best hero among the X-Men that exists in my mind right now, the character Sync shows up. We're seeing that character really uh, revitalized in the current X-Men franchise as a really powerful character of color who died and is reclaiming his life and is being explored from really incredible spaces. The biggest villain, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call Mr. Sinister right now in the current comics. He is doing all kinds of awful, terrible things. And he is a villain of villains. Uh, he has no morals and is very self-involved. So yeah, my answer may change at any given day, but those are the two that come to mind now. I was curious just to dive into one that has worked with the X-Men well, well more than myself. I, I defer to the professional as a <laughs> What is the most misunderstood aspect about the X-Men? The X-Men represent, and this could be a whole college thesis, my goodness. The <laughs> X-Men represent the disenfranchised in a way that most other superheroes do not. Uh, you can't choose to be a mutant. You're born a particular way, and then you're targeted for being born that way. And so it's all about learning how to love yourself and be present and seize your own power. So this Krakoan age of comics we're seeing is the mutants forming their own nation and uh, involving themselves in their own identity or process. But there's a reason this title has spoken to people for so many generations, people who are queer, people who are gender non-conforming, who have a skin color or an ethnicity or a disability that has set them apart from the rest of humanity. I think that's often what we miss. Now, these are superheroes. They do have mm. powers. When they develop powers, they can hurt people. So there's, there's all kinds of things. But X-Men villains tend to revolve around either evil versions of this who are <laughs> seeking to harm humans or people who are trying to dim the lights of mutants, you know, government programs or religions or people who are trying to utilize or manipulate mutants into a particular... I, I, have, I have to summarize. It, it's that commentary on what it means to be queer or different in society that really stands out to people, I think. Can you tell me a time when you worked at Marvel where your creativity was stifled? Oh, goodness. Uh, specifically at Marvel. When I was actively working at Marvel, I was pretty low on the totem pole. So I was writing the Marvel handbooks and working on various campaigns. I was living in a remote community uh, as a part of a team of writers. So everything was online. I don't know that I was ever personally stifled. I tended to take whatever assignments I was offered and did my best. Uh, and I was often recite uh, like uh, writing the encyclopedias. Sometimes I was frustrated by page count. For example, Example, I remember writing an entry in the handbooks on the character The Owl, mm -hmm. who is the daredevil villain, and I only had two pages, but I needed like four, so I had to like cut all this stuff to make it fit. So I mean, those, that's probably the only times I was ever stifled. As a podcast host, I've been overwhelmed by, uh, and I don't work for Marvel now, obviously, right. but I, I've been overwhelmed by the amount of inclusivity and respect and love that I've gotten, not only from the X-Men community, but from the professional X-Men community. It's been super cool to be part of it. And I haven't really felt stifled by that. I'm only constrained currently by my own schedule. I want to put out more than I should at a given time. <laughs> from one podcaster to another and i've been doing this for 15 years don't burn yourself out take one episode at a time release it when you can and just enjoy the time you have with the people you have on the show because that my measure of success is if i'm having fun and i'm having a blast so that's like that's a good thing <laughs> the pandemic obviously made us do a lot of things that broke us out of our comfort zone it sounds like podcasting was was a portion of that or at least a a creative outlet for you, I should say. Yeah, in the, in the pandemic, and I'll, I'll be brief here, in the mm -hmm. pandemic, I was working double hours as a okay. therapist because it was needed so badly. And also I was homeschooling my children because their school was closed. Yeah. And so the podcast was my foray back into creative ventures and connecting with people. It was just a, a like a rainbow after a storm for me. Yeah. It's been really lovely. For me, when I started, and I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but I had never done a podcast in my life. My brief summary is we were doing a webcomic database for webcomic comics.com and i said hey we should interview these creative people and my friend said sure go ahead i had very little knowledge in terms of podcasting how about yourself how did you base the show and how did you become a podcaster i guess when it came to your knowledge base yeah i have a weird set of skills right before the pandemic i spent four years making a documentary that is about a hate crime mm -hmm. and i interviewed people who had suffered this unspeakable trauma and i interviewed this awful like murderer in jail. So I have a weird set of like interviewing skills <laughs> balanced by my work as a therapist where I do a lot of like social justice work and I, I really like delve into like societal norms and understandings. 
And then you balance that with my need to storytell and connect with people. And then my encyclopedic X-Men knowledge, like all four of those skill sets coming to fruition on my show. It's been fun to just be a nerd. So my show is often very serious and very heartfelt, but often it's just very silly and ridiculous at the same time. And I, I'm really loving the balance of those two worlds. You basically have your own mutant superpower right there. You just like all <laughs> rolled into one. <laughs> we do character trials on my show. We did a character trial uh, once on the character Mesmero, who's like the mind control rapey guy and it was super silly and laughy but then the next show i put out after that was like an intense conversation about the portrayal of mind control used for sexual assault in comic book history it's both it's this really silly like mock character trial but then also like really serious focused discussions on things and i'm thrilled that i've created that space where i can use both of those sides it's informative as well too as and it's great to see because i think a lot of times people look at the medium they consume and they just consume it and they don't really think about it and the fact that you're bringing education to that uh, allows for conversation, which I think is more needed more than ever in today's age. Yeah, it's really important. My, uh, my show has a Patreon channel too, where we're doing focused character explorations. My last recording just before this was on the character Shamrock, oh, yeah. who's like an Irish caricature in comics. Uh, and my guest is Trina Farrell, who is Irish. And we do this kind of deep exploration about how Irish people are portrayed in kind of racist ways often. But it's about the silliness uh, of a character who is lucky and has a shamrock on her head. So <laughs> again, the balance of that is really fun for me. I, I always wondered, is it possible for comics to not have racial stere stereotypes or is it a sign of the times? I mean, it's both, I think. We are looking at an industry just like Hollywood or any other industry that has been dominated by one cultural understanding. And now that we're in 2020 and we have a better understanding of what it's like to be black or female or queer or trans or an immigrant in America, we can analyze the old stuff with a certain level of understanding uh, and still really pick apart why it's problematic. So I think it can be both. We don't have to call someone racist but we can still see why those times or that exploration might have racial connotations as an example. Sorry. So yeah, we're seeing these characters like reinterpreted over decades. Uh, so I Iceman didn't come out till 2012, but we can still talk about him being gay in the sixties, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what is an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh goodness, I was a kid who was extraordinarily creative. I've always been a writer uh, and I have a child. My youngest child who's 11 is this way and I love it. Uh, I used to carry a notebook with me, even as a little kid. Uh, there was one time I was going to run away from home. I was like eight. And the thing I packed in my backpack was like my notebook and my pens. <laughs> uh, I would go see like a Disney movie and then come home and like plot the sequel to the movie when I got home. I was always writing stories, plotting out like character arcs for my action figures in play, like even as a kid. I think words and language have always been really important to my discovery. Uh, my mom shares stories of me being three and four and reading encyclopedia entries on animals and then like writing down the facts on a piece of paper afterward. So like, I think it's just always been a core part of my character. And I'm seeing that in my uh, one of my children now who really is always exploring that same thing, always making things with pens and paper. Uh, and they're so funny. I'm really excited to see who they become. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in uh, your careers? This is advice I've learned myself. I don't know that anyone's given me this advice directly, but you got to do it because you love it and not because you expected particular result. Uh, for example, I wrote a memoir about my life that I'm very, very proud of. And when I put it out into the public and it only sold a certain number of copies, I had this space of going, okay, am I proud of what I did or do I feel like a failure because it wasn't more successful? And I think anybody who is a creative, a lot of us have day jobs so that we can do what we love on the side, but we've got to find ways to love what we do even when it's not what you hoped it would be, or even when you get feedback that you didn't care about. Take the feedback, listen to it, and apply it, but make sure you're loving what you do. If you don't love it, it's not worth it. And I'm interviewing a lot of creative professionals on my show where they have to learn that lesson as well. So then what is your creative kryptonite? Oh, uh, self-doubt uh, and lack of time. I, uh, I'm working on some big risks right now, but between the show and my kids and my job, it's so hard for me to carve out time 
And then I get down on myself for not having creative outlets, creating that time and then believing in myself along with understanding the complexity of the things that compete for my attention and that are part of my value system. Uh, That's a big broad-based answer, but those are my kryptonites right there. When you started the show itself and you've been interviewing all of these professionals, was there a professional or professionals, I should say, that you had on the show that you never thought you'd have on your show? My word, yes. I grew up reading comics and I had a pretty difficult upbringing. Comics were my escape from life. So some of the people who wrote the books that I grew up escaping into have been my biggest sources of joy and honor on my show. I'm happy for everyone that's come on, of course. Annie Nascenti uh, was the first big guest that came on that I was just Uh, completely starstruck. Ian Churchill was another one. He was drawing when I was actively collecting comics and really delving into them. Fabian Nicieza recently came on. Uh, I've had Roy Thomas on twice, which just blows my mind. Uh, The fact that I've gotten to interview this incredible person. And there's a long list of creators I would still love to have on the show. Uh, Louis Simonson being right at the top of that list. Yeah, the fact that I've gotten to meet these people and we have correspondence. And on any given day, I'm chatting with or emailing back and forth with creative professionals that I love and respect, it regularly blows my mind. My husband and I went out to a bar last night to watch RuPaul's Drag Race, and all through the show, I was uh, instant messaging back and forth with Chuck Austin. (laughs) And I was like, what is my life right now? It's, uh, It's so fun to have that in my life. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? Mm, That's a deep question. I think humans have an innate need on a spiritual level, not a religious level per se, but on a spiritual level to connect with something bigger than themselves. We explore and we think and we lose ourselves in the idea of what could be versus what is. Uh, And I think there has always been an innate need in almost every human to connect in that way. We live in an age where we can click anything at any time and be constantly entertained. And our brains still slow down and wonder, you know, why do I exist? And why are things this way? And I, I think that's always going to be an inherent part of being human. And we've got to find peace with that. So for us creative types, I think having that outlet is absolutely crucial. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My mother. My family went through a tremendous amount of adversity growing up. And my mom, who of course has not done everything right, has always been the mainstay. Uh, She's a creative person. She is a dedicated, incredible mom who raised seven kids basically on her own and who always gets up no matter what knocks her down. She is 79 and still uh, easily my hero. I'm number six. Uh, my little sister is number seven, and the two of us are gay. So we we always laugh like something happened there at the end. <laughs> Just balancing out the colors of the rainbow. That's all. <laughs> from a professional standpoint, you have succeeded in many different areas, from working with Marvel to being a therapist to being a writer and raising an amazing family and a loving husband as well, too. So you're professionally successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Uh, Yeah, I think I'm looking at where life is at any given moment, and I try to find success in each moment. And at the same time, I'm building toward bigger things. There's always the thing that I'm working toward. So my idea of success changes. I would love to be writing and producing full-time, to cut out the rest of the areas of my job and to be thriving in that space in a way that I can support myself and my family financially. I would love to exist in that creative space consistently and just write stories. I would love to write comics. I would love to write novels uh, and be producing the show more consistently, of course. The balance of that brings me so much happiness. So that'd be my big dream. But yes, I do try to find success in every moment. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Oh, failure is a thing that's tricky to define. I'm interviewing a lot of artists and writers. What I've learned is when we are hungry, we tend to produce. Failure, I think, is a part of that picture. When I'm frustrated, I want to sit down and channel those feelings. So I would never eliminate the sense of failure from my life. But I tend to find when I'm living in balance, failure is easy to quantify. Uh, When I'm exercising, when I'm writing, when I'm spending time with my kids and friends and doing the things that keep me in check, I feel really good. 
Uh, when I don't, I tend to get more self-critical and frustrated with what is not in my life rather than what is. So I embrace that process of failure and kind of take responsibility for it. The younger generation is looking at yourself as an inspirational person. They're becoming inspired themselves. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you looking at your work and already showing that they're being creative is amazing to see and, and can't wait to see what they do in the future. So you're inspiring them. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, the world is changing so quickly now. There are twice as many people on this planet now as when I was born. And I'm recognizing my children are being raised in an era of personal responsibility and changing definitions of what it means to be human. It's so hard for me to answer that question, uh, Kurt, because I just feel like I don't know what's coming next. But I am trying to raise kids who are aware of the world and who take care of themselves and love themselves. And I, I don't know what's going to happen out there. We're recording this at a time where messages of global warming and anti-gay and anti-immigrant and anti-trans legislation is happening. And I mean, there's all these really deep, dark, awful things happening in the world. And taking that and choosing to live defiantly with joy and love anyway is something that I try to practice in my day-to-day -day life. Whatever that means for the next generation, he said at the ripe old age of 44, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that necessarily, except I hope that we straighten out as a species and get this stuff figured out because there's a lot of darkness out there uh, and a lot of good too, a lot of joy and wonderful things. I took that question very seriously. <laughs> if your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Oh goodness. I am currently, so I wrote a memoir called Game Warm and Dad about my life and I'm actually working on adapting it into a graphic novel right now. So my life being a comic book may be an actual thing that happens this year. So I'm going to stick with that title. The soundtrack, my story in my memoir is told in two times, back from my like very conservative closeted days into like my very liberated out self. And so I think the soundtrack would be a mix of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, <laughs> for half of it. and then something just very liberated and free. I'm going to go with, I love going to coffee shops in the early morning, and there's that like slow instrumental kind of jazz riff that you hear. That's the soundtrack I want for my life, is that whatever you would hear in a coffee shop between the hours of 6 and 9 a.m., that's, a, that's my answer. <laughs> it's a little elevated from elevator music. Uh, uh, that's ironic. No, no, there's got to be like a, a beat and some variants and some things that surprise you and make you want to kind of shimmy in your seat a little bit. <laughs> and enough coffee to keep you awake in those hours as well. Too. Yep, two cups, two cups every time. <laughs> that works. Well, Chad, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to meet you. I'm so happy to connect and I'm excited to have you on my show soon. Maybe more than once, we'll talk about it. Um, if you guys would like to check, I keep my own social media private because I've got kiddos, but if anyone would like to check out Gray Malkin Lane, uh, you can follow us online, Gray Malkin PP Like Podcast on Twitter, Gray Malkin underscore Lane on Instagram. Uh, we are producing nine shows a month, which is crazy. Uh, four issue reviews where we interview a professional and then delve into an old comic book together. One character trial where we have a mock jury trial of a fictional character. And then four episodes on individual characters who don't get a lot of attention with different creative professionals on the show's Patreon channel. Uh, and I'm having such a blast. I hope you hear it in my voice. Uh, we're having a great time. So I'd love to have you check us out and see if you enjoy it. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Website's having a bit of issue, so go to my YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than my website, which is youtube.com forward slash c forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 13 or so years, and you can find that at twogeekstalking.podbean.com or on any of your audio streaming services. Search for the Two Geeks Talking brand and you'll find it. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thanks, Kurt. No problem.